So today uh, we will be discussing about KKT theorem. And the problem that we want to solve is I want to minimize f of x, x is in Rn, such that h of x is equal to 0 and g of x is less than equal to 0 and h is a function from Rn to Rm, g is a function from Rn to R R and we are going to assume that all of these functions are differentiable and smooth and all of that. So in Lagrange multiplier theorem, we, we did not have this inequality constraint, uh, but now we have added this inequality constraint. Uh, and so now we need to know what the necessary and sufficient conditions for optimality are under the inequality constraint case. Uh, the proof of the results that we'll be talking about is not too different from the case with, uh, uh, with Lagrange multiplier. So, uh, sorry, with, uh, it's not too different from the Lagrange multiplier theorem. So we will not cover the proof, but I will tell you what the KKT theorem says about the necessary conditions for optimality for this particular problem. Uh, we have seen problems of this type before. Uh, we have seen the case when you want to minimize this function with Ax less than equal to b kind of constraint, right? When we were talking about manifold suboptimization method. So we didn't have equality constraint there, we only had inequality constraint. So we have kind of seen this uh, problem statement before except that g was a linear function there or h was a linear function in like a fine scaling algorithm uh, but now these could be arbitrary nonlinear function and in fact this constraint set may not even be convex okay it could be any non-convex set <coughs> okay so what does kkt theorem uh, in order to introduce kkt theorem i'm going to uh, remind you of this set of active constraints This is <coughs> J in 1 to R such that GJ of X equals to 0. Uh, I have to give it a notation. So let me call this A of X. And we'll def define the regularity with an updated uh, definition. X is regular if and only if gradient of HIX and gradient of GJX, J is in AX are all linearly independent. Maybe I should write it as gradient of H1 and H2 and so on. So by definition, h of x is always 0, so h of x is always active, and then we have a bunch of inequality constraints that are active. So now I want all of these gradients, so all the gradients of all the active constraints, so these are active by default, and these are active at a specific point x, so they are all supposed to be linearly independent. Okay. Now what does KKD theorem says? 
x star is a local minimum and a regular point implies there exist lambda star in Rm, mu star in Rr such that the same as gradient fx star This is the first condition. Second condition is mu j star is greater than or equal to 0 for all j 1 to r. Mu j star These are all the conditions we have. Yes. Uh, lambda values can take any values. It can be positive, it can be negative. But mu j is always has to be non-negative. Yes. What is the range uh, of j in the first uh, condition? Uh, j, j goes from 1 to r and i goes from 1 to n. No, I mean, if it is uh, it's not from a x. N where? Here? 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 Yeah. No, it goes all the way from 1 to r. But it turns out that for for Constraints that are not active, mu j star is 0, so those terms will not appear here to begin with. Okay. <coughs> so let's see what we are trying to do here. So we have a set of active constraints. All our constraints, all our derivatives of the constraints are linearly independent at all points. And my x star is a local minimum and, and it, it's also a regular point. Then there exists Lagrange multipliers lambda star and mu star such that the first derivative of the Lagrangian is zero. This was also the case for equality constraint. So in some sense, the first condition is not very different from what we had studied for Lagrange multiplier theory. Uh, so the first derivative of Lagrangian is zero. The second and the third, third uh, assertion, these are the new assertions here. So the first assertion is that for every inequality constraint, the corresponding Lagrange multiplier will always be non-negative. And for constraints that are not active, the Lagrange multiplier will always be equal to zero. <clears throat> so at the constraints that are not active, my gj of x star is strictly negative. Let's try to get an intuition of why second and third should be the case. Why should we have mu j star greater than or equal to zero and this mu j star should be equal to zero for inactive constraints. And even though we are not, uh, the intuition I'm going to build assumes second order sufficiency conditions to be valid because I'm going to invoke sensitivity theorem here to give you the intuition. Uh, but you know, if you go through the math, 
you will realize that the second order sufficient condition is not needed. So if you remember sensitivity theorem only applies when the sufficient conditions are met but in this case the sufficient conditions like we have not talked about it but the sufficient condition is essentially going to be similar to what we studied for Lagrange multiplier theory. So let's see uh, why should mu j star be greater than equal to zero. So Let's try to think about it the following way. I want to minimize, I'm going to try to solve a simple problem. I want to minimize f of x such that g of x is less than equal to zero and this g is a, and this is in real line. Basically I want g to be mapping into a real line. So I have a function f that I want to minimize and this is my g of x less than equal to zero space. Let's consider another function. I want to minimize, not another function, but another constraint. G of x is less than equal to epsilon. Epsilon is some positive number. for that okay so I'm going to change the constraint a little bit so my new constraint set is going to look something like this this is my GX less than equals to epsilon line this is my f of x star This is my f of x epsilon star. Can someone tell me what's the relationship between these two numbers are going to be? So I'm increasing the constraint set. So my constraint set was smaller. I have now increased the, expanded the constraint set by a small amount. Okay, this epsilon is a small number. So I've expanded the constraint set a little bit. So now I'm minimizing the function over a much larger region, okay? So here I'm minimizing the function f of x over a much larger region. Here I have like a restricted region and I'm minimizing the function over a restricted region. So what do you think is the relationship between these two values, optimal values? Projection. Sorry? Projection. Uh, Not projection. Uh, like, are they equal, are they greater than equal to, are they less than equal to, what's happening? This? Greater than equal to. Yeah. That's right. Okay. Because now I'm minimizing over a larger region, so the value of the function could, like the value of the optimal solution must be lower. I mean, it may not be lower, it could be equal, but it can only decrease. So what does sensitivity theorem says? If I expand the, uh, if I increase the value here, okay, so what is sensitivity theorem? So this is, mu star for this problem mu star is going to be p epsilon is what is the sign of this Derivative? 
oh, there has to be a negative sign here. What is the sign of this derivative? Any thoughts? Yes. Uh, why is it negative? Because when you increase the space, it makes it a smaller value. Correct. So remember that this derivative, I'm going to erase this picture. All of you agree with this? Right? It's an approximation and epsilon is a small number and this is less than or equal to zero. Right? And sensitivity theorem says mu star is negative of the optimal solution, uh, the derivative of the optimal value with respect to the change in the constraint. So I have a negative sign here. So this negative sign and this negative sign basically implies that mu j star must be greater than or equal to zero. Okay? That's roughly what the intuition is for the Lagrange multiplier to be non-negative for the inequality constraint. Because if you expand the inequality constraint slightly, the value of the function optimal solution is going to reduce. And if it reduces, then it means that this sensitivity is negative. And then with this negative sign, the Lagrange multiplier becomes non-negative. Sorry? Uh, so when mu star is equal to gradient of f x x star to x o. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. For this, um, it will be when mu star is equal to gradient. If this is equal to? Uh, when, when mu star is equal to this equation. When is? Uh, when, when mu star is equal to this equation. I'm not able to get your question, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Just. Uh, uh, when mu star equal, equal to this equation? Uh, when is mu star equals to this equation? Yeah. Why, why is it equal to? Well, technically speaking, this result only applies if second order conditions are satisfied, the sufficient conditions are satisfied. So I'm just giving you like a gut feeling of why mu star should be non-negative. Okay. So this condition uh, requires uh, the sufficient conditions to be valid. We'll talk about sufficient conditions in a bit. Okay. Okay. So this tells you mu j star has to be non-negative. Now why should mu j star be equal to zero for inactive constraint? So if at x star of epsilon, this particular constraint is inactive, it means that g of x star is actually strictly less than zero. Let's, let's write it. Uh, so say g of x star is strictly less than 0. If I increase it, if I increase, expand the boundary, it's not really going to change the optimal solution at all. So x star epsilon will be equal to x star if g of x star is strictly less than 0. Because all you are doing is, it's already an, uh, an optimal solution. It's already a local minima. You expand the boundary, the local minima doesn't change. As a result of which, this particular value is going to be 0. And so mu star will be equal to 0. That leads us to the third expression. So any questions on this uh, KKT theorem? There will be the second order necessary condition also that I'm going to write. But uh, I want to take any questions on the first order conditions first. I'm trying to understand where, it, uh, where this fits in. 
where the where this, this fits at, where, they, where, where we apply this. Uh, where are you going to apply this? So you've already seen, you've already seen questions of this type, ax equals to b types. You've seen ax less than equal to b types. Now, if you have a bunch of constraints that involves both of these, then you will apply like KKT theorem based approaches. And uh, very soon, I'm also going to talk about how to convert uh, this this class of problems into one another. So the one with pure inequality constraint or the one with pure equality constraint. So let me get, get to it in a bit, okay? I'm going to define Vx star the first order feasible variations as D such that this is for all I. Then the fourth condition is So now again, as was the case in Lagrange multiplier theorem also, we picked all the active constraints. We took the first order feasible variations uh, among the active constraints. So the first order feasible variation is that it should be orthogonal to all the gradients of the constraints at that point x star. So that orthogonality is basically gradient transpose d equals to zero for all the active constraints. And then for all such d, I want the second derivative of the Lagrangian, but only with respect to x. So I'm taking the derivative only with respect to x. The second derivative of the Lagrangian uh, should have this d transpose second derivative d is non-negative for all d in v x star. So that's roughly, uh, that's what the second order necessary condition looks like for this case. Okay. So what I want to show you is bunch of ways to look at this particular problem and that leads you to like if you apply Lagrange multiplier theorem's uh, proof, you will essentially recover this particular result. So one way to think about this problem is I want to minimize f of x such that h of x equals to zero and max of gj x zero is equal to zero for all j. Let me call this gj, gj plus x. Now this becomes a equality, a problem with only equality constraint. There's no inequality constraint anymore. 
what's the drawback in this case? Yeah. Uh, not quite. It was not convex to begin with. Lagrange multiplier doesn't require convexity. But it has something to do with it is not something. What is that not something? Or differentiable? differentiable. This function is no longer differentiable. Okay? Because you are taking max of two numbers and max is not a differentiable operation. So that's one way to think about it. The second way to think about it is I want to minimize f of x and this is uh, minimization over x and z. h of x equals to 0, gj of x plus zj square is equal to 0. So z is in rr and x is in rn. This is another way to think about it. And now this also becomes an equality constraint problem. Any other, any questions on this? So these are the two ways by which you can convert the inequality constraint problem into a equality constraint problem. Now if you start with an inequality constraint problem, how do you convert it to a, uh, sorry, if you start with an equality constraint problem, how do you convert it to an inequality constraint problem? So let's look at an approach Let's look at that approach. I want to minimize f of x such that h of x is less than 0 minus h of x is less than 0. g of x is less than or equal to 0. This one? Yeah. But you are constraining it to be equal to 0. Okay. So gj of x can be negative or 0, but it cannot go above 0. Okay. Right? That's why there is an equality constraint there. What is the problem with this kind of approach? I mean, I, I think it's not very clear what the problem with this approach is. It looks pretty easy. Like you have any quality constraint, you can add a bunch of inequality constraint and now your problem is only with inequality constraint. The real problem here is sometimes you want to have functions, sometimes you want to have points in the feasible region such that g of x is strictly negative. Uh, we will talk about barrier method, like it's an optimization solver for inequality constraint problem. So we'll talk about barrier method in the, in the, on Monday's class next week. So you cannot really apply this kind of transformation to the problem in order to apply barrier method for a specific reason, because barrier method requires you to have an interior point where gx is strictly less, less than zero. So if you convert the equality constraint into inequality constraint, you no longer have that option because all the feasible points x will satisfy hx equals to 0. So there is no point where hx will be strictly less than 0 and minus hx will also be strictly less than 0. So that's roughly the problem with this. But I'll, I'll emphasize this problem once again next, next week on Monday when we talk about barrier method. Because we can't apply barrier method to problems of this type. Okay. Uh, any other way to convert uh, 
this equality constraint into inequality constraint? Not really. <laughs> There's no other way. Okay. Now, what is the any any question so far on uh, problems with mixed equality and inequality constraints? Everything is clear. So any point x star, lambda star, and mu star that satisfies these conditions would be called a stationary point. And whenever we come up with an algorithm that solves this problem, it converges to the stationary point. And then we need to check if the sufficient condition holds or not in order to establish optimality. So let's see what the sufficient condition says. Uh, Let x star in or x bar in Rn, lambda bar in. Okay, let me. I'll have to change all of this x star. Uh, yeah, let me just erase everything. And then Five is a new condition here. So for all active constraint, the corresponding Lagrange multiplier must be strictly positive. Oh, sorry, sorry. This is not equal, to, not in all inactive constraint. Yeah, thank you. So these three were the same conditions we had in the case of uh, necessary condition, but those are the two new conditions that have been added here. One is for non-zero D, this inner product has to be strictly positive, and then the Lagrange multiplier corresponding to all the active constraints must be strictly positive. 
if these five conditions are satisfied, then x bar is a local minimum. Any question so far? No? So what have we done until now? Uh, we have looked at problems with equality constraint and we figured out that Lagrange multiplier theory gives us the necessary conditions for optimality. Then we did, we added this inequality constraint and then we realized that KKT conditions give us the necessary conditions for optimality. And the points that satisfy, the key thing to remember here in this class of problems is the existence of Lagrange multiplier. So if regularity assumption is satisfied, then there exists Lagrange multipliers that satisfy the whole bunch of conditions, you know, conditions of this type. Um, then we saw the sufficient conditions for optimality under these two cases, uh, which is basically uh, uh, the so if, if the points satisfy these sufficient conditions, then uh, it is a local minimum. Note that for uh, sufficient conditions, we haven't made any regularity assumption here. Okay, so we don't care about regularity when we talk about sufficient condition. But let me check uh, about this claim. Yeah, I don't think it requires regularity. So sufficient condition doesn't require regularity at all, but it requires some other set of conditions such that mu j bar has to be greater than zero for all j that are active. So there's slight differences. Uh, there are other necessary and sufficient conditions that don't, I mean not sufficient condition, but there are other necessary condition like Fritz Zorn condition, which doesn't require regularity, but we are not going to study that in this class. It's there in the book. Uh, if you think about it, like problems of this type have appeared in many cases. Uh, especially if you are doing network optimization or wireless communication or um, you know where all network optimization occurs. So I know like some civil engineering, anybody from civil engineering here in this class? No one from civil engineering? So sometimes civil engineering folks also have this inequality constraints and equality constraints uh, when they are talking about flow of materials through pipes and whatever, ducts and so on, uh, or when they study like the river flow, okay? So the river flow has to meet some conditions or whatever, like they, they, they study like uh, things that have inequality constraints as well. So, and the reason why I know it is because people have studied those problems in optimization uh, projects over the years. So that's how I know a lot of these problems uh, appear in other areas as well. Uh, in network optimization or in the uh, wireless systems, you typically have rate constraints. Like you cannot send information beyond a certain rate. So those constraints also appear in the form of inequality constraints. So those, uh, uh, so a lot of problems that have these kind of conditions, we need to, uh, so what was I saying? So I think my train of thought was that we've done a lot of necessary conditions for optimality, we've done sufficient conditions, there are other necessary conditions and other assumptions on H and G that people make and come up with new necessary conditions. Like for instance, H is linear but G is nonlinear, or H is nonlinear but G is linear and then so on and so forth. You can make like multiple assumptions on these functions uh, and then you can come up with your own sufficient and uh, necessary and sufficient conditions for optimality. So a lot of those conditions are given in the book, but the KKT theorem and Lagrange multiplier theorem, these two are the most general ones and that's why we have studied them in the class. Um, but, uh, but there are other conditions as well, so don't think of it as the only set of necessary and sufficient conditions. So if you are encountering a problem where you have like more structure on this, you can perhaps uh, come up with simpler results than what is required here and try to exploit that structure for coming up with algorithms. Okay. So let's talk about uh, barrier method for now. Uh, 
uh, it seems to me that we I finished whatever I wanted to cover 15 minutes early, so I have 15 minutes to spend. Uh, so let's talk about barrier method. So now we are going to talk about algorithms for solving problems of this type. So I want to solve a problem of this type. There's only inequality constraint. There's no equality constraint. My x is in some set capital X. X is assumed to be a closed set. And I define the set S. So we want S to be non-empty. We want assumptions. S is non-empty and any point for every x in feasible region there exists x in in s such that x it converges to x equals to zero. This is my set S. So S not include J X equal to zero? No, X, S doesn't include the, the boundary. It just includes everything away from the boundary. And this assumption is trying to say that S is non-empty, so you have to have point away from the boundary. You can't have a situation where there is there's nothing where GX is strictly less than zero. So that's the first part. S must be non-empty. And then for every X in the feasible region, I should be able to come up with points in S so that the limit is the feasible point. So if I pick a point here, X, I can always pick the sequence Xn to be the Xn to be X itself. But if I pick a point here, then it's not in S at all, but it is in the feasible region. But I can always construct a sequence. So each of these points are in S. 
but it eventually converges to a point at the boundary. Okay, so that's the assumption I'm trying to make here. So this uh, condition is satisfied. And now the idea is as follows. I'm going to create a barrier function B of X such that B of X goes to infinity as G of X goes to zero. This is my B of X. So as I approach the boundary of the set, the barrier function goes to infinity. As I approach the boundary of the set, the barrier function goes to infinity. Can someone construct a function like that? A function that goes to infinity as GX goes to zero. But remember, gx is kind of increasing to zero because gx takes negative values. Uh, gx is less than or equal to zero. So I want something that takes as input a negative value. And as that negative value becomes closer to zero, the function bx should shoot up all the way to infinity. x squared will not blow up to 1 over x, OK? So b of x equals to summation minus 1 over gj of x, j equals 1 to r. OK, so as gj of x goes to 0, this function goes to infinity. And this function goes to positive infinity. Remember, gj of x is going to 0 from the negative side. So this is always negative. And as I take gx goes to 0, this function goes to infinity. Any other function that comes to the mind? One. Okay, now you will take all the <laughs> all the exponents of gj. Right. Okay, one over gj x of square. Perfect. This will also work. So you don't have to have a negative sign. Let me give you another one. Anybody else has an idea? Or any thoughts? Log of minus, yes. Log of minus gj of x. And there is a negative sign here as well. Okay, so I've created this barrier function. This is known as logarithmic barrier function. This is known as inverse barrier function. And the property of the barrier function is it escapes to infinity as gx goes to zero. And now here is my algorithm. I will pick epsilon k, which is less than epsilon k minus one, which is less than epsilon k minus 2 and so on. And I want to minimize So what did I do? I have this function f of x. Uh, 
let's say a function that looks something like this. I'm going to pick a small parameter epsilon k multiplied by barrier function b of x. What would the function look like? This is my f of x. As soon as I add this barrier function, this function was, was just a normal function. But now, with the barrier function, this particular thing is going to look something like this. This is my f of x plus epsilon k b of x. Okay? And now I'm solving this particular problem only for x in the set capital X. And I get xk as a solution for this. Let me call this uh, argument as xk. Okay, so how do I speed up this optimization? So at every point of time, I'm picking an epsilon k and I'm trying to minimize this particular function, this joint function over the set capital X. Let's assume that this computation is easy to do. This computation is not that difficult. How can I speed up computation of x of k? So every point of time, I'm solving an optimization problem, which is kind of completely different from the optimization problem I solved in the previous time step. Why would it give me any advantage? No, it's not a tricky question. So the, the, the answer is, whatever output we get from this optimization problem at time k minus one, it serves as an initial condition for running the optimization at time k, okay? So what we are going to do in this algorithm is, we start with an epsilon zero, we solve the optimization problem, then we use that result as a initial point for running the optimization problem for time for k equals to one, and then I'll run the optimization algorithm again, and then I'll get x1, and then I'll use that as an initial condition for getting x2, and so on and so forth. Now in the next class, we are going to talk about how to solve linear programming problem using this algorithm. Uh, this method was actually proposed in 1984 for solving linear programming problem, and it's one of the fastest algorithm for solving linear programs with logarithmic barrier function. So we'll solve linear program with logarithmic barrier function. And the cool thing which we are going to do in order to solve the problem is we'll only take one gradient iteration at every point of time. So uh, rather not gradient, but we'll just take one Newton step at every point of time. So we start with epsilon zero, we solve the problem, then we get to epsilon one, we take only one Newton step at epsilon one, then we change epsilon again, and then we take one Newton step with epsilon two, and that's how we'll solve the overall optimization problem. And eventually, what we are going to show is that xk would converge to x star. So that's the approach we will be talking about on Monday next week. Uh, there's no class on Friday uh, because it's spring break, no, fall break, autumn break, whatever break that is. And then uh, we'll have uh, exam midterm on, uh, on Wednesday. In midterm, you're allowed to bring your handwritten notes. Uh, it'll be in class. You will have 55 minutes to solve the midterm paper and I'm able to solve it in 10 minutes so you get 5x my time, which is, I think, reasonable. So anyways, I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Thank Hi. you. You can get calculator, but calculator will not be required. But yeah, you... You, you won't need it though. No, you won't need it. <laughs> Syllabus is uh, assignment one, two, three. Everything we've covered in assignment one, two, three.